mute, that'd be excellent. Uh, yes, yeah, so we are um, recording today's session, so uh, please be aware of that. It's just so we can use the recording for anyone who's not able to get along today or if you've got colleagues who might like to, to see it. So uh, yeah, thanks once again, everyone, for coming and we will we'll get started now. Um, so I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledging their continuing connection to land, water and community. And we pay our respects to the peoples, cultures and elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the memories, uh, the culture and the hopes of their peoples. And I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work on uh, Dara country and they have uh, a beautiful way of welcoming people, which is to say Warami Welmabami, which means welcome wherever you're from. So welcome everybody. Uh, I'd like to introduce you now to Anne Hooper. Uh, we're very lucky to have Anne leading the rehabilitation audit this year and is uh, a very skilled stroke uh, clinician and nurse practitioner and data extraordinaire and she'll be taking you through this training session today uh, uh, and and going over what this year's rehabilitation looks like and what the processes are that you'll uh, go through if uh, you're part of it so over to you Anne. Thanks Mel um, thanks everybody for joining in so many of you joining in uh, today it's fantastic thank you so much for that um, so we're just going to go through some information. Some of this has been sent out to you already in um, some of the emails that I've sent out before, but we just want to make sure that everybody's um, understanding the processes and everything. So just wanted to start off um, with the consent forms. So thank you so much to everybody that's already sent those through. Um, just a reminder, if you haven't completed it, if you could please send them through to us by the 25th of March. Um, and I do get asked quite a lot who can sign the consent forms. So that is just um, about following your local process um, for governance. So whoever would normally sign those kind of forms in your um, at your site, um, if you just follow that process, that would be great. And then, yeah, back to me by the 25th of March, please. Um, and I should just mention, so Mel is just keeping an eye on the chat for me because I can't see it while I'm presenting these slides. So if you've got any questions or anything, pop them in there and then we will get to those at the end. Thanks, everybody. So today's session is pretty much aimed at people who have not been involved with OSDAT before. Um, so I think there's a couple of people that are not on mute. If you could all just please make sure you're on mute, that would be great. Thank you. Sorry, Anne, you're currently on mute. Thank you. Muted myself. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, today's session is is aimed at people who have not been involved in um, data entry in the OSDAT before. Um, but it's also, as Mel mentioned, it's a few years since we've done the rehab audit. So um, it's also a good refresher for those of you that may have been involved previously, um, but it's just been a while. So. Um, and I do want to give credit to my predecessor, Ashley Mamo, who was um, involved uh, doing this role last year. She has created some of these slides and they were too good for me to um, to not use. So I just want to give her credit. And I also just flag that some of these slides, they do mention the acute audit. The process is the same. Um, it still applies to the rehab audit, which is why I've been able to leave them in this presentation. So. This slide is really just flagging the tool that we use for the audit is OSDAT. So it's the Australian Stroke Data Tool. Um, and it is the highest level of security available and housed on a server with internationally recognized standards for information security management um, best practices. It's been built to work on any web browser. So it doesn't matter what you're using at your site. I know a lot of the public health sites have Edge as their preferred browser. Um, Queensland Health, for example, doesn't really support Chrome, but whatever site you're using, um, OSDAT should work. But if you do have any problems with your browsers, just let me know and I will see what I can do to help. In terms of user accounts, the OSDAT has two different types of user accounts. So there's the hospital coordinator and the data collector. So the hospital coordinator is really the main contact person for your service. 
um, and they are overseeing the data collection. They may have a slightly they have a slightly different role in terms of um, what they can do in relation to closing records, for example. Um, and they have that overall responsibility for the data quality. And I know that some hospital coordinators are also um, doing the data entry as well. Um, and then we have the data collector who is primarily entering the audit data throughout, throughout this period. Now, if you're new to being a hospital coordinator um, and you don't have an account set up yet in Ausdat, please let me know, just send me an email and I'll create an account for you. Um, and if you have an existing account that perhaps has expired, it may have been a while since you've been in the Ausdat then as well, just let me know and I can update that. So in terms of creating an account for the data collector, so this is part of the role of the hospital coordinator. And I'm just gonna play a short video that really just um, demonstrates how to do this within the Ausdat. Oh, no, I'm not, because that went to the next slide. Let me just try that again. Okay, so um, you will go to the administration tab in the Ausdat, click on users, um, and then there's two things that you can do. You can search for the person in those um, in that search box, um, and it, or you can select a new user. Um, when you select new user, you just need to fill in all of that information. Um, with the expiry date, the best thing is to um, select an expiry date that's about a month after the end of the data collection. So we will finish at the end of May. So if you set the expiry date to sort of end of June, um, beginning of July, that would work well. And then the data collector box will be the one that is pre-populated for you to complete. If somebody is um, an, uh, a data collector and enters data for OSCA or for the QASC programs, then obviously bear that in mind when you're selecting their expiry date. Um, we don't want to limit them from being able to get in and uh, enter that data. Cool. Um, all right, so once you've created the account, um, the user will receive an email, um, an activation email. And it's really important that you click on that link within 72 hours because otherwise it will expire. So if you don't manage to activate it within 72 hours, you know, potentially the person's on leave or RDOs, um, then it's just going to the OSDAT tool, um, clicking on forgot your password, and then when you put in the email address, it will generate a new email. One thing just to bear in mind, these emails may go to um, your junk email folder. <clears throat> so just keep an eye on that. Um, if you don't receive an email at all, then let me know and um, I can try and work out what's going on and we can sort that out. Once the link has been activated, so once the account is active, um, the OSDAT will um, prompt you to create a password um, and then the fun begins. Trying to create a password that is, um, that is, is acceptable. So, uh, it's the usual scenario of using numbers, upper and lowercase letters. Um, it's uh, one suggestion as well is to create a phrase <clears throat> that you can easily remember. Um, I I, uh, I would suggest that you sort of make a note of it somewhere safe. Um, it's probably against all IT principles, but uh, just in case you forget it, just make a note of it. Um, but if you do forget it, it's not really a drama because you can go back into the login page, click forgot your password, and then um, you can generate a new one. But the security level for OSDAT is really high because of the nature of what we're doing within that um, tool. So it won't let you create a password until you create one that it, it considers acceptable. If you are going back in and need to reset your password because it's just been a while since you've accessed Ausdat and um, and you just have forgotten what your password was. Um, if you don't know what email you used for your account, then let me know and I can find that out and we can um, get you back up and running. If you're using Ausdat for the first time, when you first go in, you will be um, required to read and agree to the terms and conditions. Um, so it will show as, uh, as in that box at the bottom of the slide. And then if they get updated at any point, you're prompted to just agree to the new terms and conditions. One thing that you will find, <coughs> excuse me, if you have not um, worked within Ausdat before, if you don't do anything within the screen for nine minutes, you will get this pop-up banner 
um, that says that your session is inactive and do you want to continue? So you just need to click on that continue button that pops up. Um, and it's just telling us that, that yes, you're still active. And it's obviously a, uh, it's a security measure. Um, the times when this will pop up will be most likely if you're in the clinical audit, for example, and you're in a patient record and you're trying to find some information um, and it's taking you a while to find that information and you just have forgotten that um, you've got the OSDAT window open. So when you go back to your OSDAT window, you might find that this has popped up and it might have even logged you out because if you don't click continue, it will log you out of the, um, of the tool. <clears throat> But don't panic if it has logged you out because the information is all automatically saved. So you're not going to lose any information that you've been putting in. Um, and I'll ignore the acute audit. Sorry, I forgot to update that one earlier. Um, this is all the information that has been provided. Most of these documents have now been emailed out. So um, everything except the data dictionaries was emailed out to all my contacts on Monday and will be listed on Inform Me, um, hopefully by the end of this week. If it's not the end of this week, it will be very beginning of next week. Um, and so that's the link where you can find the information. And I think it's been on um, emails and documents that I've sent out already. But those are your key, um, key reference documents that you'll need as you're going through the audit. The two documents that I really want to highlight um, are, whilst well, they're all useful, um, these documents, the two data dictionaries, so your org survey data dictionary and the clinical audit one, um, these are absolutely essential for you to have to hand while you're going through this audit. So they provide um, definitions and guidance as to how to answer all the questions in the audit. So there may be questions that you read them and you're like, oh, I don't really know. Um, how to interpret that question. I'm not really sure what it's asking me and where to find the information. Um, within that data dictionary, you should be able to answer, get the answer to that question. So it will provide a bit more clarity as to what the question means. And then the auditing guidance should um, just break it down a little bit more and maybe give you a couple of tips as to um, what it's meaning and what you should be looking for. Um, and this is your source of truth. These two documents are your source of truth when you're completing the audit. And um, they should be being referred to throughout the audit. So it's really important that they are easily accessible for all the auditors um, that are involved at your site. And by using these data dictionaries, it means that we just have a consistent approach. Everybody is on the same page. We haven't got different auditors and different sites all interpreting things differently. Um, it means that the data is going to be valid um, and useful at the end of the day. You're putting so much effort into completing this audit. Um, we want to make sure it's worthwhile for you. <clears throat> so the first thing that you're going to do when, um, when you start this audit is the organizational survey. Um, the best thing to do is when you complete this, or this org survey is to sit down with the um, rehab director, um, perhaps some other senior staff, the nurse unit manager on the on the ward, on the unit, maybe the nurse director if they're um, sort of very involved um, in your service, the allied health director. This being a rehab audit, it is pretty allied health heavy. Um, so it can be really useful to have the allied health director involved from the get-go. Um, and the way that I've found the easiest to get this done is I've gone through the survey beforehand, check my answers, and then had everybody in the room together and just had it up on a screen and gone through it so that everybody's happy with the answers. Um, and you don't find that then, you know, when the survey results come through later in the year that people are questioning why things were answered in the way that they were. Um, so that's just the way that I've done it, not necessarily that it's not absolutely not the only way to do it, but um, that's the way that I found worked for me. So the organizational survey opens on the 1st of April, so it's only two and a half weeks away, um, and then closes on the 28th of April. So there's four weeks in which to complete the org survey. But my recommendation is to really try and get that done as soon as you possibly can, because until that's completed, you can't start on the clinical audit. So when the hospital coordinator first logs into the OSDAT from the 1st of April, um, the, the, there will be a message that comes up onto the screen um, that prompts the hospital coordinator to complete or review the, the org survey. 
As the hospital coordinator, you can't progress beyond anything within the OSDAT until you have completed this org survey. So just bear in mind if you are, um, as the hospital coordinator, if you are also completing OSCAR data or QASC data, it won't be very many people given that we're doing the rehab audit this year, but I know there will be some people that um, go across both services. Uh, you will need to clear this um, org survey before you can get in to do your, your OSCAR data. If your site participated in the audit in 2020, your answers will be there that you, so you can just review your answers um, and then just update the information. There are a handful of new questions, not very many. Um, so those will obviously require new information, but otherwise you'll be able to just check off everything and just be, um, be sure that it's still accurate for this year. Um, if you have never participated in the audit before, then um, obviously you'll need to complete it from scratch. So when you go into the org survey, um, if any of the boxes are left blank or um, there's some incorrect information that's been entered, the tab on the left there, the rehab tab will show is red and you can't submit the survey until everything is complete. So when that is green, um, you will be able to submit it. And once you have clicked submit on the survey, then you can start the clinical audit. So just to flag again, just so that everybody understands, um, you cannot complete that, you cannot commence that clinical audit. Um, nobody can, data collector or hospital coordinator, um, until that org survey has been completed. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's um, open for editing up until Friday the 28th of April. If you have com if you have submitted your org, org survey, org survey, if you have submitted it and you need to go back to it at any point to change any of the information before the twenty eighth of April, that's not a problem. It's easy to do. I'm just going to show you how that would work. So you go up to the data collection tab at the top, down to the Stroke Foundation organizational survey, and then for this audit. Although in the video they're clicking on the acute audit, you're going to click on the rehab audit and then you can click on edit by hospital details and this will all these boxes will open. It will look slightly different as I mentioned this is for the acute audit but the concept is still the same um, and everything will be automatically saved. You don't need to resubmit or anything like that. Just update your answers, um, click on return to view and then you're good to go. So once the org survey is 100% complete and you've submitted it, you can begin the clinical audit. So the audit criteria, now these have been sent out um, in the various reference documents that I have sent um, earlier in the week and also in the fact sheet that went out um, with the original invitation to participate. Um, if you are not, if you don't currently participate in AROC, um, in the AROC registry, then these are the records that you will need to request from your medical records department um, for inclusion in the audit. Um, in terms of the dates of the um, admission, so you're looking at the 1st of January through to the 30th of November, um, and they must have been admitted to and discharged from your service within those dates. Um, and with the list of patients that you have in your um, in your report that you're going to enter, just make sure that they do all meet those um, eligibility criteria from the previous slide before you enter them. Um, patients' records can be removed if um, if there is an error made, but it makes your life and our life a bit much easier if we get the right records in the um, in the um, OSDAT right from the get go. One thing just to flag, um, if you have a patient who during their rehab episode is snapped to an alternative episode of care, so maybe you've got a patient who is um, snapped to acute, they get a chest infection and they're snapped to acute for um, a few days, consider that the end of their rehab admission. So they may well go acute for three or four days, they may get snapped back to rehab they may have not even left their rehab bed while they've been snapped to acute. Um, but as, as soon as they are snapped out of a rehab episode of care and into something else, whether that's palliative, acute, 
um, maintenance, although it's unlikely they'd snap to maintenance and back to rehab, but um, as soon as they're snapped out of rehab, that is their end, the end of their admission for the purposes of this audit. Um, don't include the subsequent episode if they do get readmitted back into rehab, you know, a few days later, just disregard that subsequent episode of care. Just focus on that first one where they are um, have that initial admission into rehab. So the patient record management page, this is going to be your go to page really whilst you're in the clinical audit. That's where you're going to go to create a new record, search for your patients for the records. Um, at the end of the audit, you're going to export the records from here and also create the re reliability checks. So just to flag um, for those that aren't familiar with it, so the OSDAT is used for multiple different programs. So we're using it here for the um, Stroke Foundation audit. So we use it for the rehab audit and the acute audit, but it is also used um, by the Australian Stroke Clinical Registry, OSCA that I've mentioned already today, um, and QASC for their Australasia trial. Um, so bear in mind that the OSDAT only stores one record per, per patient, but they may have multiple episodes within that. And you will see that um, when you go into the patient record view. For those that do participate in AROC, and I've had this question um, a couple of times so far uh, in terms of how will you get your information. So there is some information, some um, data that you provide to AROC that overlaps with what we are asking for within the rehab audit. So to try and make life easier for you so that you're not having to double up on all the data entry, um, AROC is going to provide some information for you. So once AROC has consent from your site, so that is either the consent that you've sent to us where you've said, yes, we consent to um, sharing data with AROC, um, or you've already provided consent directly to AROC as part of your normal processes with them, they will send you a spreadsheet of your eligible stroke admissions. Um, they will send that directly to you so that you're aware of who your patients are going to be for the audit. If you are a larger service and you have at least 40 admissions um, throughout the year, they will send you extra. So they may send you a list of 50 to 60 patients um, so that you have some surplus patients because chances are there will be a handful that are on that list that actually once you start going through their notes, they're not eligible for the audit. So it just gives you that little bit of um, little bit of leeway. And then those surplus patients that are in the, the tool, we will just remove them um, later down the line. So they will send the spreadsheet directly to you. They will also upload that data directly into the OSDAT. So you don't need to do it. Um, it will it will all be there for you to find. And I just want to flag that none of this information, this patient identifiable information is coming to me or to Mel. It's not coming to the Stroke Foundation. We don't receive any of this patient data um, and we won't have visibility of any identifiable information. So when you then are going into the OSDAT and you're trying to find the um, the records, so if you're an AROC site and your list um, is already populated in um, the OSDAT for you, you're going to want to find your patient. So um, you'll go into that patient record management screen and you can search for your patient. So any patients, any records that have already been created for your site will show on that screen. So you can see there's a couple of um, patients listed at the bottom of the screen there. That's what you'll see. Um, and then you can refine your search. So everybody will come up initially, you can refine your search and look for particular patient. If you're working through your, your list of records, um, you can search for that particular patient. Once you know their OSDAT ID, make a note of it. So um, hopefully you can see my mouse here. Um, this number here, bottom left of your screen, this six digit number, that is the patient's OSDAT record ID. So I would highly recommend if you are an AROC site and you receive your spreadsheet um, with all your patients listed on there, make a note of their OSDAT ID on that spreadsheet so that you can easily go back to that record if you're needing to um, update any information later on down the line. Um, it would just make things much smoother for you. Uh, yep. 
If um, you don't participate in, in AROC, and we do have a number of sites that are participating in the audit um, who are not involved with AROC, um, you'll need to create a new record for your patient. Um, and so just going to show you how to go about doing that. So you will click on the data collection tab, go down to patient record management and click on new record. Once you've done that, when you um, you just need to enter the patient's details that are listed on the screen there. Um, in this example, we don't have it, but at the bottom of your uh, bottom of the list where it says programs, there will be a box that says National Audit of Rehab Stroke Services 2024. So you will just tick that box and then click on Create New Record. What happens when you do that is those details create what's called a statistical linkage key. Um, and that creates an episode identification number. So those keys um, prevent duplication of patient episodes within the OSDAT. What's really important for you to know is that the patient's first and last names are not stored um, when that linkage key is created. So, um, and the patient's first and last names are not accessible to the staff at the Stroke Foundation. Um, it's only visible to you. So that's uh, just an important um, sort of process within the OSDAT for you to know and understand um, that makes the data very secure. If you try and create a new patient record for um, an episode that is already in the OSDAT, so maybe you've searched in the previous um, screen, you've searched for the record and you haven't found it, if it is there already, it will prompt you. It won't allow you to create a new record if there is already one there for the patient in the rehab audit. So you've created your record or you've found your patient. You, this is um, now the patient record view that you will land in. You will notice in this example, the patient is listed, is entered into the Oscar Red program and also the rehab audit program. Um, bottom right of your screen, you'll see there's a uh, way that you can hide information so that you only see what is relevant for you completing this audit. So by ticking only the box for the um, rehab stroke audit, um, that's the only data that you will see because there is some information that overlaps between um, the different programs and it just makes it a bit easier to work with and clearer for you if, um, if you hide that. I do want to flag um, something on this screen um, that is really important. Um, and you'll see just here, um, it says expand this record for select programs. For, and then to drop down for selecting in the program. Please, please, please do not click on this box and select um, a program. We do not want you to expand a previous record. So um, the Oscar, if the patient is entered into the Oscar Red program, that's an acute episode of care. It is not related to the rehab audit. They are two completely separate episodes. And if we start expanding records um, between acute and rehab, um, it really does uh, cause a lot of um, confusion, I guess, and chaos within the data. So please, please just avoid this space, uh, this spot on the on the patient record. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I've done it myself in the past. Um, and yeah, it, it, um, it doesn't make you too popular. So don't do it. Um, yeah, it happens. Uh, and we will fix it if you do it. But, um, but just try not to. You, as you go through the audit, some questions will be disabled because they are not relevant to the question. If you've answered, um, depending on what you've answered in the previous question, the, the subsequent ones may not be relevant. So they will be grayed out. What I would just say is if there is a question that is grayed out that you don't think should be, if you think that it flows on from the previous question and is relevant and you feel like you should be able to answer, answer the questions that are there, please let me know because it, you know, Technology does go wrong. Um, it may be an error. Um, so please just flag it and then I can just be sure that it is correct. Um, and any grayed out questions don't impact whether or not the audit looks um, and uh, ends up being complete. When you're in the audit, you can change um, between views when you're looking at the screen. So as you're seeing that screen now, 
um, that is in the editing format. So this is um, this is acute data, but it, this is um, it, where you're able to edit and answer all the questions. But you can switch that if you want to have a look to see which um, questions still need answering that are relevant um, for the audit. So you see now we've got a different view. Um, so you can't go in and change any of those questions until you click on edit again. So it just enables you to see, you can see on the left hand side of the screen, um, as you're looking at it now, you can see all those green boxes. That tells you that all of those sections have been completed and there's no incorrect information, there's no errors there, there's no sections there that are incomplete. If any of those little buttons on the left hand side there are yellow, um, that tells you that section is not complete or if they are red, then there's an error in there somewhere. So what you're looking for is that whole side of the screen to be green. When, um, when you're in that patient record view, as we were seeing before, patients may be involved in, in multiple programs. I just want to flag that if somebody is in, um, has a, an episode in OSCAR as well as in the rehab audit. The completion of the OSCAR record has no bearing and no impact on being able to complete the rehab audit. So um, you can really disregard the, um, the state of completeness for the um, other programs. All you want to see is that the rehab um, program is at 100% complete. That's what you're looking for. And once that is at 100% complete, the hospital coordinator will see a close button. Um, and so part of the responsibilities for the hospital coordinator is once that, um, once these records are sitting at 100% complete, is to come along and just close off those records, which means that they can no longer be um, edited. If for whatever reason, uh, there's a requirement to reopen a closed record, the hospital coordinator can do that. So you can see there it says uh, there's the reopen option on the bottom right of your screen. Um, so the hospital co coordinator can do that. Um, after the data collection period closes, so after the 31st of May, um, you're not able to reopen those um, closed records. So if there is something that desperately needs changing, um, you'll need to contact me and we can sort that out. A handy um, option, I guess, within the OSDAT is that you can keep an eye on how many records have been completed through the audit. So in order to do this, um, you click on the data collection tab at the bottom of the screen. We've been there a few times already through this presentation. Um, click on the data collection tab and then down to patient record data collection statistics. When you click on that, this is what you'll see. So this bottom, this box at the bottom, um, you can see the name of the program. So we've got the rehab audit. It will show you how many records are open um, and then how many are error, um, have an error, how many are incomplete or how many are complete and then closed. And then you've got the, um, the percentages there. So at a glance, as you're working through the audit, it's really easy to be able to just pop in and, and see um, how your site is progressing. Once the, once the records have been closed, we do ask that every hospital um, complete three to five reliability record audits. So that's the case of doing um, auditing the same record twice um, using two different auditors. The reason for that is to make sure that we have consistent and reliable data collection. So we can see that different people are answering the questions in the same way. And it just means that we can be sure that the, um, the data that's being entered is more reliable. Um, so once it's been closed, you can see that the option is there to create a reliability record. Um, and it will give you the option um, obviously, this will say National Audit of Rehab Stroke Services. The program isn't in the OSDAT yet, which is why I can't um, use this for examples. Um, but you will select the Rehab Audit and then Create to create that new reliability record. 
So in order to complete the reliability record, the auditor will log in, um, find a closed rehab audit record. Now in the past, as the hospital coordinator, I have um, selected the reliability records um, just at random and, um, and then let the person know which ones to go and find. Um, so that's one way to do it, or just um, the, the auditor can just go and find uh, a closed record. It doesn't matter which one. And then create the reliability record, as we just um, saw on the previous screen. Um, as with the full audit, um, each section will turn green as it's been completed, and then just click return to view to take it out of the editing um, stage when that's been finished. Uh, and you'll know that it's a reliability record because you'll see this pink um, reliability record um, label um, at the top of the screen. Um, what I would suggest with these reliability records is once you've created them, make a note of the record ID. Same with the other, all the other audit records, make a note of the ID. I have found it notoriously difficult to, to go back and find these records, um, the reliability ones sort of at a later date. Um, they don't seem to me to be um, super easy to find. So if you just make a note, you're, you've got your spreadsheet of all your patients that you're including um, in the audit, um, just make a note of the extra um, OSDAT ID so that it's just really easy for you to go back and find it. And then once you've completed all the audit, all the audit uh, the hospital coordinator can go in and we recommend that the hospital coordinator um, exports all the records um, to keep a copy of the files. So um, it also means then that you have a record of all the data that's been entered for your site. You can use that data for um, your own quality improvement. It also means that you can see exactly what you entered um, very easily, uh, and especially if we're coming back to you and asking for clarification, um, to if we need to check the accuracy of any of the data, it's easy for you to do that um, from your spreadsheet. All right, we're nearly there. Uh, I know this is a really um, this is a really dry topic, so um, thank you for bearing with me. Uh, so, in terms of some top tips for your data entry, if you have more than one person that's doing the audit, I recommend that you have um, regular catch ups throughout the audit process, just so that um, you have the opportunity to just touch base. Uh, and make sure that you're all on the same page with how you're answering the questions. Any sort of tips or tricks that you've discovered as you've been going along, you can share those with your colleagues, um, but it will just make the process a lot easier um, and make sure that the, uh, the, the data that you're entering um, is much more consistent between you. You may find it helpful to establish a group, some sort of group chat. So whether that's WhatsApp or email or Teams, um, Email you may find is a bit slow if you're needing an answer, you know, how would you interpret this question? It might be a few days before somebody gets back to you. So, um, you know, probably something that's a bit more uh, responsive might work better for you. Um, we do suggest you limit the number of auditors, and I've had this question a few times over the last couple of weeks about how many people should be involved. I've done the audit where I've just been the only auditor, and I've done it in um, groups of up to four people. We've only done it once, I think, of with four, and I, I personally, I wouldn't do more than four because I just think that you run the risk of having some, um, you know, increased variability in terms of how people are interpreting the questions. Um, so I think, you know, ultimately it's down to you and how you want to work it at your site, but um, I would just be mindful of how many people you get involved. And always refer to the data dictionary. So as I said, you know, earlier on, that is your absolute source of truth. Um, uh, what I've done previously is, um, you know, print it out. I think I mentioned this before, print it out and give everybody a copy, um, but, you know, however you choose to work it, just make sure that you as a team are always referring back to that if you have any questions about how to answer a question. And if you're not sure and you're not getting the answers from the data dictionary, then reach out to me and I will um, I will help. So as says there, get in touch at any time if you have any questions at all. So those are all the details that you need. Um, 
as I've said several times now, data collection starts on the 1st of April, so it's not long. Um, so what you should be doing now, the hospital coordinators, you guys need to be logging into the OSDAT, making sure that your access is sorted, um, create those data collector accounts so that they are ready or, you know, check the expiry dates for anybody that um, is already an existing auditor. Um, but really, this is your phase to, to get ready and um, just be raring to go. So thank you for bearing with me. I, as I said, I know it's a bit dry, but it's important that you guys have a really good understanding of this process. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll open it up to any questions. Thank you, Anne. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, and we have um, quite, a, yeah, quite a few very good questions to answer in the chat. So awesome. uh, I'm going to give you a chance to have a sip of water and stop talking for a second and answer the first couple, and then I'm going to um, swing some to you. But I just want to start with uh, the first question, which is, can OSDAT uh, or see the names of the patient, or can the, is the patient name visible at all in, in the OSDAT? So it's a really important and good question. Um, so the way that this works is when you first create a patient record, you enter um, patient demographic details. One of those is the patient name. So um, let's say, for instance, that um, my name is Melissa Smith um, and my birth date is the 2nd of June 1900. What Ausdat is going to do is get, say, the 2nd, 10th, um, seventh and ninth letter of my name, not that exactly, but there's, you know, a, there's something like that. And then it's also going to take particular numbers out of the birth date and it's also going to apply something else. So th that creates a code for that patient and it prevents there being duplication of records and it means that the patient is de-identified. So we've talked a lot with people about this. Pro it's it's a, it's called a, a statistical linkage key or it's just a code that represents that particular patient. And so it's used by government agencies and it's um, approved as a method for de-identifying patients uh, in a way that they can't be re-identified. So, uh, so yes, whilst you've typed the full name, the first name and last name into that initial screen, the full name is never stored in OSDAT and it's never visible and they're never re-identifiable. So um, thank you for that question. Uh, and that, that's the way that that process works. Um, so the next one is, uh, is there scope uh, to access a training site to practice, please? This will be, I'm, I'm new to auditing. Uh, thank you, Alita. And so there's, there's not, but what we do have um, when we first put the this year's audit into the OSDAT tool, uh, we run through and we test uh, that it's all working and that it's all logical and we've got all the right questions in there. And we usually ask a couple of clinicians to come and do that with us. So perhaps we, that would be a mutually beneficial exercise. So uh, if you don't mind if, uh, emailing Anne at the end of this session, if you'd like to go through that process with us, then uh, that would be great for us both, I think. Um, the next question is if we have less than 40 cases, for example, 30 cases only across the whole year period, can we still participate? Yes, you absolutely can. Um, we say 40 uh, really for data validity. We want to make sure that there's enough cases in there that you're going to get back a report that represents uh, how things work at your site. So um, we'd love for there to be 40. We do accept, um, you know, 20 if that's as many as you have and you feel like that's going to be useful feedback to you. Uh, so, yeah, we, we prefer 40, but certainly we won't exclude you if it's less than that. We wouldn't send less than 20 cases for, for analysis. Um, the next question is if we only have one data coordinator, do I need to find another two auditors for reliability records? So I, ideally, if you can, that would be great. Just the more eyes you've got on it, um, the more likely you are to, to notice if something uh, 
is a miss, but we also really understand um, that sometimes that's not possible. We've both been rehabilitation clinicians. We get like the constraints. So look, if you can find another person and they're the only one that's able to do it, that's okay too. Um, so um, do you have an idea of when AROC will send me my patient lists? Anne, I'm going to give that question to you. <laughs> sure. Um, I would expect that that would be next week. So we just have to um, finalise the data fields within the OSDAT and then we can generate the, um, the file format for AROC to be able to drop your data into. So as soon as we've done that, which will be the beginning of next week, um, Tara should be able to populate those um, files for you. We know that we, you know, you want to get those as soon as possible. Um, so yeah, I would expect it to be early next week. Okay, excellent. We've got uh, probably 10 more questions in chat and we've still got 15 <coughs> minutes to cover them but I noticed that there are two people with their hands up and I just wanted to invite you to unmute yourself and to ask your question if you'd like to. Rosalind I've got you as number one on the list would you like to ask a question? Oh, oh, sorry am I unmuted yet? Sorry I probably not listened properly. In the past I, I recall from memory that we used to get our own patient list with people whether they are you know, which type of stroke we were working for and get those impairment codes. But you guys are uploading a list for us this year, is that correct? Or If you participate with AROC. So, okay. yeah, if yeah. you don't, then you'll need to create your own list with your medical records. But um, but if you participate in AROC, oh. that will be done for you. Yeah, honestly, don't know. <laughs> it's been a few years since we've done it. I've got a bit rusty. You, that's right. That, if you, um, if you can drop me an email after yeah. Rosalind and I can um, okay. work that out with you. Because... Just going to ask, so you have like all the impairment codes of like 16 point whatever, but I wouldn't have anywhere near enough patients under that impairment code. The 1.2s and stuff I do, but not those. So does it have to be that, those impairment codes or? Yeah, it does. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to meet the quota this year. We've had more of the other types this, this past year. Okay. Um, we can we can chat about this after if you like, Rosalind. Yeah. I can catch up with you. I can give you a call either you know later today or tomorrow, and we can we can chat yeah, through and see how it's going yeah. to work for you. Yep, no problem. No worries. Thank just you. um just drop me an email so that I yeah. remember to come back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Rosalind. Uh, over to you, Phil. Thanks. Um, thanks, Anne. Um, just a quick question. Or sorry, a quick comment. I guess this will be our eighth order at our hospital. So. <laughs> Um, you know, old hands at it. Yeah. Um, I can't stress enough the importance of writing down the OSDAT patient ID. The second any auditor puts a patient's name in, you have to write it down because as the hospital coordinator, later on when there's some question about a patient, <laughs> there's no patient names, the number comes back to me and if someone hasn't written it down, it drives me mad trying to find it. So, you know, I just have a sheet with 50-odd you know, patients that people in sequence do it and say you must immediately, before you even start the audit, put that bit of information down. So it was just to, to, um, to stress that. And the other thing is we're very lucky in that we have a group, um, the Stroke Link group that we've been meeting for many, many years, um, and we buddy up with the audit. So we have a, a social worker with a nurse or a physio with a, uh, you know, a speechy so that they can go through and just check as they're doing a single patient's audit. And that makes it much easier for people. But I recognise right. some sites won't have that many people. It was just a comment, so. No, that's lovely. Thank you so much, Phil. It's really interesting um, and useful, I think, for everybody to hear how different sites do it. Um, you know, one person's experience is maybe quite different to somebody else's. So as you said, you've been doing it for a long time. Uh, you've got some of the tricks of the trade. So thank you for, for sharing those with everybody. Appreciate it. Donna, did you have a question you wanted to ask Donna? Yes, I did. I'm flicking between mute on, mute <laughs> off. <laughs> no um, I just, we, when we're giving advice of, of what to do, um, I, uh, there's no way I'd be able to get all of my heads of together to go through my um, organisational audit. So I actually printed out the ones that you sent to us and then 
then I can take that with me and then I can go and talk to the physio heads and fill in the physio bits, talk to the rehab doctors. It, that That's just a hint for other people when they're yep. doing their organ. If you don't have time, if you can't get everyone together in one room, um, print it out and then not all the questions apply if you answer yes or no to some, but but then you've got all those questions that you can actually speak to the people about and walk around with them and not have to have them come to the computer. Definitely. Great. Awesome. Thanks so much, Donna. Uh, Kian? Hi, just a quick one. There's lots of information that's been presented. I can't remember half of it. Who do I go to uh, for questions? <laughs> Me. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Anne. Great that's presentation. okay. Most of the information is in the documents that have been sent out, but um, yeah, just drop me an email or give me a call um, anytime. That's what I'm here for. My my sole purpose in life for the next couple of months is to get you guys <laughs> through this audit. So yeah, just just reach out. Okay. I'll make it uh, when you fulfill your sole purpose. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll head back now to the questions that we have in chat. Really good question here. And uh, if someone is snapped to acute, what if they're only in acute for a few days and then re-snapped to rehab and they remain under the same clinician in rehab when they return? Yeah, thanks. Well, thanks, Alex, for this question. Um, so essentially, I understand that um, they are essentially in the same rehab admission in concept in that, you know, they may well be in the same bed and have remained under the same clinician, but um, administratively they have, they were discharged from their rehab episode of care, admitted to a, an, a, an acute episode of care and then, and then admitted to another rehab episode of care. Um, and the, the tricky thing is that if you, you know, if you consider that a second admission, the admission processes are going to be completely different. So the data that you'd be collecting wouldn't make sense because you're not going to go through that whole admission process. This is a patient that's known to you. Um, so we have, Mel and I have have debated this. This has been a, you know, a hotly debated topic to try and really get some clarity over this. Um, and so even if they are only snapped to acute for a few days, uh, that is the end of their admission. So just whatever day they are snapped to acute, 24th of April, um, that is the end of their rehab admission for the purposes of this audit. Thanks. Do you want to add just... anything to that, Mel? No, I think you've covered oh. it all. Sorry, can I just ask, just, it's Alex who put the question hey, up. Yep. Sorry, I might just be a bit vague on this, but um, okay. with AROC, put, on our um, AROC data that we submit, it's we do have suspension times and... Um, where they've been snapped back to acute mm -hmm. because they've got... So will that have any impact on the data that AROC's putting in? Because I, so AROC's only going to give us one episode, the first episode for that patient. Does that make sense? Let me... Uh, do you know what I'll do, Alex? I'm going to take that offline and just confirm that with Tara at AROC um, and just confirm that the discharge date um, that she provides would be the discharge date would be the date that they are snapped to acute. Because um, yeah, we have quite a few patients who yeah. snap backwards and forwards throughout their, like they may have two or three episodes of acute yeah. stages. So that will get quite confusing. Yeah. And for AROC, it's just a suspension. So yeah, I understand, I get what you're saying. Um, at the moment, we will stick with, we're saying at the end of, you know, if they're snapped to acute, that's the end of their admission. Um, but I will confirm that with Tara and, and just can. Okay, so it, to it's their first snap to acute, that's their, that's that's their whole admission for this. All right, done. that's fine. For the purposes of this audit, but I'll, I'll just confirm how the AROC data is going to look in relation to that. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Okay, we've got a question here with um, the Oscar ID. So will it link with the OSCAR ID already in, uh, in for the stroke registry in the OSDAT tool? So no, it'll be a separate number because the OSCAR ID is related to the episode. So um, whatever ID you have, so the patient, if they are, if they've been entered into the OSDAT for OSCAR, they will have an ID for that OSCAR episode. And then when you enter them for the rehab audit, they will have a new um, record ID that is created. So consider each each time the patient is entered into the OSDAT, 
they get a new ID. It's the, it's like a new visit. So they um, they are completely different. And I'll just add to that, the reason being is OSCAR is one program and the audit is a, another program. And while we can link up uh, some common variables between the two, um, we can't see, they're, they're completely separate. So we can't actually see anything in any of the other programs and it has to be considered a, a different record entirely. Um, another question for you, Anne. Uh, uh, Kathy is a NUM in rehab at Modbury um, and wondering how to find out who the hospital coordinator is. Um, email me and I'll tell you who I've got on the list. I would say I could tell you right now, but my other screen has just gone blank. Um, and so I can't see my spreadsheet. Um, so Kathy, yeah, if you can just drop me an email, um, I'll let you know who I've got for Modbury. I definitely have somebody for Modbury. I just can't think off the top of my head who it is. All right. Um, we've got someone uh, requesting a consent for the AROC data transfer. Um, which is probably a, a, a question for Tara at, at AROC. So, um, yeah, I see it. Yep. Yeah, so, I, um, I imagine that you would have the contact deals, details for Tara, but if you don't, do ask Anne and she can uh, get you in touch. All right. So, uh, when records are pre-filled from AROC into the OSDAT tool, what percentage of the record will be completed, Anne? That's a really good question. I it don't is. know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually know the answer to that. I want to say it's about 5 to 10% of the audit. That's I've, I'm pretty sure that I've heard that number. Mm. Um, but even Tara probably can't give us that answer until she sees exactly what it is that we're collecting this year but um i would expect it to be around that kind of figure my understanding is that in the past it's been about 10 percent, and it's expected to be yeah similar again so yeah uh so another question regarding uh admission uh what about a second admission during the same year um it's a really good question phil based uh, based on what we were just talking about i think if it's a completely separate Admission, do you know what I mean? Like if if they've had another event that has generated, you know, unfortunately our patients have multiple strokes requiring multiple rehab episodes. Um, so if that's the case, that it's a new, it's a change in their condition that has required a new rehab admission, I think that's valid. Yep, that, that was what I was questioning, so thanks. Yep. Thanks, Phil. Uh, and we have another question uh, here from, from Deirdre. So Deirdre's question is, why can't we create a new episode for the patient um, rather than creating a new record and have different dates? I think it's just a terminology. So it is, a, it is essentially a new episode. You're not creating a new patient. Um, the, the record, the patient is, the patient remains in the system. You're just creating a new um they call it a record. It's it's the terminology is a little bit confusing, but you're you are you're just creating a new episode essentially, Deirdre. Um, that's that's all it is. The patient will only be in the system once. Thanks, Anne. Uh, we've got a couple more questions which I'll move on with because we're, we've only got a minute to go, and I expect people will be needing to move on with their days. Uh, Okay, uh, Ken, the reason we don't remove the expand option completely is that the tool is shared with a bunch of different programs and it's not a super flexible tool at the minute. <laughs> it's being updated as we speak, so there'll be something, a new improved version next time you do the audit, but it's not possible right now, unfortunately. And we do use it for, um, we do use it for the acute audit. Mm. Um, Okay, just going to the bottom to see what else we've got. Do you have an idea when AROC will send me my patient lists? I cover two hospitals. Yep, so hopefully early next week. Um, and Linda, yes, I will send out the data dictionaries um, hopefully by the end of this week. Um, that's, my, that's my goal. 
uh, unless things go a bit pear-shaped, but but my my aim is for you to have them by the end of this week. Um, and any questions that we don't get to, um, I'll answer them in the chat so that you'll you should still see it come up. Um, hopefully, uh, or um, you know, if there's anything that's unanswered, just drop us an email. The other thing that we will do, um, which I haven't mentioned, is that once the audit is up and running, um, I'm going to run a like a Q&A session, a drop-in session. We'll just run for about you know half an hour or so. We'll let you know when it is, and you can literally just drop in, and we'll just answer any questions that you might have. You know, once you've started entering the data, and you're like, oh, I don't get how I'm supposed to do this, or this doesn't make any sense to me, you can just drop into that session, and we will, um, you know, I'll just be there, uh, and we can answer any questions that you've got. But ultimately, I'm also just here, so just get in touch mm -hmm. if you know if you've got any questions at all. Uh, a question that's come up a number of times, Anne, is about um, um, receiving information that's already been sent, like consent forms. So, uh, for anyone who's asked that question, if we have, if if we can see your full name in the chat, if that's um, what you uh, appear as, uh, or and have your email address, then we will can most certainly send you exactly what you've asked for. Um, we can resend any communications or consent forms. So um, we'll just pull all of that from the chat and send it to you after the session today. So uh, if there's any information like consent forms you're missing and you want to let us know in the chat now, that would be great and we'll, we can send that to you. Um, I just want to answer Donna's question quickly, sorry. She's just said we can't start the audit until May 1st, is that correct? So no, you can start, so the org survey is the 1st of April. As soon as that is done, if you get the org survey completed on the 1st of April, you can start doing your clinical audit. Um, awesome. There's no, yeah, there's no delay on that, Donna. Um, the earlier you get that org survey done, the better, and then you can just crack on. I know you're going away, so yeah, just... As soon as that org survey is done, you're you're open, you're good to go. Um, thank you very much, Lauren, for your comment. You're very welcome. Uh, so we've we have run out of time. It's two minutes past three, and I'm aware that there's still a number of questions that we haven't been able to answer. So what we can do is take those offline now, and we can um, do a written response, and then we can send that out to everybody so that you've got. Uh, those questions in an email over the next couple of days. So uh, apologies that we couldn't get to it all. It was a very well attended session. There's 160 people online, <laughs> uh, which is great. It just shows the a wonderful interest in audit and feedback and, you know, a commitment to quality improvement. So we're very grateful uh, for you being here and for Absolutely. you participating. And uh, thank you all so much and uh, look forward to doing this audit with you. Thank you so much, everybody. Get in touch if you need anything at all. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. You're welcome. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Bye. Bye, -bye.